teacher, author, theologian, and an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm happy to introduce to you Elder Hugh B. Brown. I should like to dispense with all formality, if I may, and simply say to faculty members and student body alike, my brothers and sisters. I adopt that form of salutation for several reasons, among them being the fact that all, or practically all, who are here are members of the church which is sponsoring and maintaining this school. And secondly, I say brothers and sisters because in my more mature years I am coming to realize, I think a little better than I did, the eternal fact of the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of men. I say brothers and sisters too because I do not intend to undertake a sermon, a lecture, certainly not an oration, but I would like for just a few minutes to bear my testimony to you people. I'd like to take the witness stand in defense of the proposition that the gospel of Jesus Christ has been restored to the earth in our day and that this is the church of Jesus Christ. Now I say I would like to take the witness stand. I'd like to be able, if I could, for in just a minute to give some reasons for the hope I have and for my allegiance to the church. Perhaps I can bring it to you most quickly by referring to an incident which happened in London, England in 1939 in September, just before the outbreak of the war. I had come to know rather intimately a very prominent English gentleman, a member of the House of Commons, a member of the cabinet, formerly one of the justices of the Supreme Court of Britain, the author of many of the books which we in Canada studied while we were preparing for law, and in my conversations with this man on various vexations of the soul, as he called them, we talked frequently of religion. Just before the outbreak of the war, he called me on the phone and asked if I would come to his office and discuss with him finally some phases of the gospel because he said, I've been intrigued by what you've told me. I think there's going to be a war. If there is, you'll have to return to America and we may not meet again. The latter statement proved to be prophetic. I went to his office and he said this, in effect, I'm not only intrigued, but a bit troubled by some things you've told me. And I, I wonder if you would be so good as to prepare for me a brief on Mormonism. I may say to you students that brief is something that men like President Wilkinson prepare when they're going into a court with the intention of presenting their case and giving their reasons for their position on any given question. He said, will you prepare a brief on Mormonism and come and let me be the judge and you discuss Mormonism before me as you would discuss a legal problem? He said, first I'd like to say to you that you have said to me a time or two that you believe that Joseph Smith was a prophet. You have said to me that you think that Jesus of Nazareth and God the Father appeared to Joseph Smith. Now he said to me, that's fantastic. He said, the thing I'm troubled about is to think that a barrister and solicitor from Canada a man trained in logic and evidence could give himself over to such palpably 
absurd ideas. Now this man, brothers and sisters, this, this great judge is one of, the, one of the most intellectual men I ever met. I think he had the most incisive mind. He's my, his, his mind seemed to me to be almost like a steel trap. And when he said, what you tell me about Joseph Smith is fantastic, I was bold enough to suggest to him that we <clears throat> perhaps should prepare or go forward right then with our discussion. I said I'd like to present my brief right now. He had intimated that I'd probably take three days at least to prepare for it because he said I'm going to give you three hours in which to present it. When I told him I was ready at the moment, I suggested to him that we have what in Canadian and English law and to some extent in this country is called an examination for discovery. An examination for discovery is briefly the getting together of the opposing sides, the attorneys and the plaintiff and the defendant, and seeing if they can find some area of agreement and thus save the time of the court later on. I said perhaps we could have an examination for discovery here and see whether there is some area of agreement. And from there we can start to discuss my fantastic ideas. He agreed to that quite readily and I said, of course, I am proceeding on the assumption that you are a Christian. Certainly, I assume you believe the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, to be the word of God, I do. You believe what's written in the book, certainly, yes. You say that my statement that God spoke to a man in this age is fantastic and absurd. To me, it is. Do you believe that God ever did speak to anyone? Well, certainly, all through the Bible we have evidence of that. Did he speak to Adam? Yes. Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Moses, Jacob, Joseph, and on through the prophets. I believe he spoke to every one of them. Do you believe that that kind of contact between God and man ceased at the meridian of time or when Jesus appeared? No, he said it reached its climax, its apex on that occasion. Do you believe that God spoke through Jesus? Yes. Was he the son of God? He was. Do you believe, sir, that, and I'm going to have to shorten this considerably because I said it took me three hours to tell it to him and I must tell it to you in less than 30 minutes. Do you believe, sir, that after Jesus was resurrected and after he ascended into heaven, and I assume you think he did ascend into heaven? I do. Do you believe that a certain lawyer, sometimes referred to as a tent maker, by the name of Saul of Tarsus, on his way to Damascus, contacted that very individual, namely Jesus of Nazareth, who had been crucified and had ascended into heaven. Do you believe that Saul saw light and heard a voice? I do. Whose voice was it? It was the voice of Jesus Christ, for he so introduced himself. Then, my lord, and that's the way we speak to justices in the British Empire, my lord, I am submitting to you in all seriousness that it is, has been standard procedure throughout all recorded time for God to talk to men. He says, I think I'll have to admit that, except that it stopped shortly after the first century of the Christian era. Why did it stop? I can't say. You think that God hasn't spoken since then? I'm sure he hasn't. There must be a reason. Can you give me a reason? I do not know. May I suggest a reason or several? Perhaps God does not speak to men anymore because he can't. He's lost the power. He said, of course, that would be blasphemous. Well, then, if you don't accept that, perhaps he doesn't speak to men anymore because he doesn't love us anymore. He's gone off and left us to find our own way in the dark. Well, he said, God loves all men of all ages. 
and is no respecter of persons. Well then, if he could speak, if he loves us, then the only other possible answer as I see it is that we don't need him. We've made such rapid strides, we're so well educated, we have such great science, we don't need God anymore. And then he said, and his eyes were moist when he said it, Mr. Brown, there never was an age in the history of the world, there never was a people or a time when the voice of God was needed as is needed now. And then he said, can you tell me why he doesn't speak? And my answer was, my Lord, he does. He has spoken, he is now speaking, and all we need is the faith to hear him. And then we proceeded to, rather quickly, and I must not refer to very much of what we proceeded to do, but we proceeded to prepare what I have been pleased to call a profile of a prophet. And I wonder if you students would like to fill in the various things that I'm now going to mention and add to them as you will, and then see whether Joseph Smith measures up. Stand him up against that profile and see where he comes in. We agreed between us and this in pursuit of our examination for discovery of ground on which we could both stand. First, we agreed that any man who claimed to be a prophet of God also claimed to have been spoken to by God. We agreed that any man so claiming would be a dignified man. No table jumping, no whisperings from the dead, no clairvoyance, but a dignified, clear statement of truth. We agreed that any man claiming to be a prophet of God would declare his message without any fear, courageously and without making any weak concessions to public opinion. We agreed that if he were speaking for God, he could not make concessions, and we agreed that ordinarily what he taught was not in harmony with the generally accepted teachings of the day. We agreed that such a man would speak in the name of the Lord and say, Thus saith the Lord, as Moses, as Jeremiah, and others. We agreed that such a man would predict future events and predict them in the name of God and that they would come to pass, as Isaiah and Ezekiel. We agreed that he would have not only an important message of before his time, but ordinarily a message for all future time, such as Noah and Malachi and others. We agreed that his courage in su uh, supporting his statement of truth would be such that would enable him not only to endure persecution, but to give his life, if need be, for the cause he had espoused, such as Daniel, Hosea, Joel, David, and others. We, be, we agreed that such a man would denounce wickedness peerlessly, that he would generally be rejected by the people of his time, but that as time went on, he'd grow in stature, and that they who put him to death would find, if they could live on, that their descendants would build monuments to his honor. We agreed that he would do many superhuman things, things that no man could do without God's help. We agreed that as he grows in stature, the consequence of his work would be among the most convincing evidences of his calling. By their fruits ye shall know them. We agreed that his teachings would be in strict conformity with Scripture. We, believed, we agreed that his words and his writings would become Scripture. Now I've gone quickly and left out a lot which you can fill in, but I ask you in all seriousness to stand the prophet Joseph Smith up against that profile of prophets and see whether he measures up. And as a student of the life of the prophet Joseph Smith for more than 50 years, I say to you young men and women, there is no claim 
which any prophet has made in connection with his prophetic calling, which Joseph Smith cannot qualify under. Think it through. I said to this friend of mine, I believe that Joseph Smith was a prophet of God because he talked like a prophet, he taught like a prophet, he lived and died like a prophet. I believe he was a prophet of God because he gave to this world some of the greatest of all revelations. I believe that he was a prophet of God because he predicted many things in the future which have come to pass since the prediction, things which only God could bring to pass. I said to him and I say to you, I believe that Joseph Smith was a prophet of God because John on the Isle of Patmos, the beloved disciple of Jesus, declared that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And I submit to you and I submitted to him that if any man who ever lived had a testimony of Jesus and gave his life for that testimony and was effective in spreading the testimony and bringing convincing evidences of the truth of the statement that Jesus is the Christ among all the men that have lived I challenge any man to show one who has given us more real evidences of the divine calling of the prophet of Jesus Christ than did the prophet Joseph Smith. I believe that prophet Joseph Smith was a prophet because he did do many superhuman things. One of them was translating the Book of Mormon. Some people will not agree on that, but I submit to you and I shall refer, I think, to some, some substantiation of my statement. I submit to you that the prophet Joseph Smith, in translating the Book of Mormon, did a superhuman task. I ask you students to go out and write a Book of Mormon. I ask you to write one chapter of a Book of Mormon. I ask you to write, if you can, any kind of a story of the ancient inhabitants of America. And I ask you to write it without any source material. And I ask you to include in your statements with respect to the ancient inhabitants of America some of the things which the prophet Joseph included in the Book of Mormon. I ask you to write, for instance, 54 chapters dealing with wars, 21 historical chapters, 55 on visions and prophecies. And remember, when you begin to write on visions and prophecies, you must have your record agree meticulously with the scriptures. You will write 71 chapters on doctrine and exhortation, and here too, you must check every statement with the scriptures or you'll be proven to be a fraud. You must write 21 chapters on the ministry of Christ and everything you claim he said and did and every testimony you write in your book about him must agree absolutely with the New Testament. I ask you, would you like to undertake such a task? I would suggest to you, too, what you're up against in connection with this book you're going to write or the chapters you're going to have to introduce here. Figures of speech, similes, metaphor, narration, exposition, description, oratory, epic, lyric, logic, and parables. Undertake that, will you? I ask those of you who are under 20 to undertake it. I ask you to remember that the man that translated the Book of Mormon was a young man, and he hadn't had the opportunity of schooling that you have had, and yet he dictated that book in just a little over two months and made very few, if any, corrections. And for over a hundred years, some of the best students and scholars of the world have been trying to prove that the Book of Mormon was not the Word of God, and they've taken the Bible to try to prove it, and not one of them has been able to prove that anything he wrote was not in strict harmony with the Scriptures, with the Bible, with the Word of God. The Book of Mormon 
not only declares in its title page that its purpose is to bring the knowledge of Christ to the people, but the whole of the subject matter has that as its central theme. And there is no chapter in all literature, sacred or profane, which I say to you as a lawyer has greater evidential value than the chapters in 3rd Nephi, where multitudes of people said, we saw him, we felt of his hands and his side, we know he is the Christ. I said to my friend, my lord, I cannot understand you saying to me that my claims are fantastic, nor can I understand why Christians who claim to believe in Christ would persecute and put to death a man whose whole purpose was to prove the truth of the thing they themselves were declaring, namely that Jesus was the Christ. I could understand them persecuting Joseph and the rest of us if he had said, I am Christ, or if he had said there is no Christ, or if he had said someone else is Christ, then Christians believing in Christ would, might, would be in justified to some extent at least in persecuting or disputing with him at least. But what he said was, He whom ye ignorantly serve, declare I unto you. Paraphrasing what Paul said in Athens, He whom ye ignorantly worship, declare I unto you. And Joseph came to Christians and said to them, You've been claiming to believe in Jesus Christ. I say to you that I saw him and I talked with him. He is the Son of God. When Joseph came out of that wood, at least four fundamental truths came out with him, and he announced them to the world. First, that the Father and the Son are separate and distinct individuals. Secondly, that the canon of Scripture is not complete. Thirdly, that man was created in the image of God. And fourth, that revelation or the channel between the earth and the heaven is open and is continuous. I'd like to say to you students, there's nothing so far as I'm concerned in all our claims finer and more challenging to students in any field of activity than the one which says we not only believe what God has revealed and does reveal, but we believe that he will yet reveal many great and important things pertaining to the kingdom of God. That is a challenge to research. It's a challenge to check on what you've believed. It's a challenge to bring your beliefs, your thoughts, your education, your lives up to date. May I just say to you, and perhaps some of you are wondering, what was the reaction of this judge when we'd finished, he sat and listened intently. He asked some very pointed and searching questions. And at the end of the period, he said, Mr. Brown, I wonder if your people appreciate the import of your message. Do you? He said, if what you have told me is true, it is the greatest message that has come to this earth since the angels mount announced the birth of Christ. This was a judge speaking, a great statesman, an intelligent man. And he threw out the challenge, do you appreciate the import of what you say? He said, I wish it were true. I hope it may be true. God knows it ought to be true. I would to God, he said, and he wept as he said it, that some man could appear on the earth and authoritatively say, 
Thus saith the Lord. As I intimated, we did not meet again, but I bring you just in the briefest form two or three reasons why I believe that Joseph Smith was a prophet of God. But undergirding and overarching all the rest, I say to you from the very center of my heart, I know that Joseph Smith was a prophet of God. And all of these evidences and many others that could be cited may have the effect of giving me, in a sense, an intellectual conviction, but by the whisperings of the Holy Spirit, one may come to know. And by those whisperings, I say, I do know, and I thank God for that knowledge and pray for his blessing upon all of you. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. I am subdued and humbled by your presence. I am especially humbled by reason of the fact that I have chosen to consider with you young people this morning the greatest character in all history, the Son of God our Redeemer and our Savior. I wish to discuss that with you for a few moments because you are just on the threshold of life. You are seeking for supports and guides as you undertake this journey and there is no life to which anyone could refer you from which you will get the inspiration and guidance and help that you may have if you will become acquainted with him. Now I shall not attempt to preach a sermon, certainly not to deliver an oration or give a lecture, I come to you, young people, to bear a humble testimony based on personal knowledge. I should like first to quote a text from John. In the was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And all things were made by Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. And then I should like to bring to you His message. This is life eternal. To know Thee the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. If then it is life eternal to know him, certainly he has prepared a way by which we may know him. A discussion of this question, this subject of God and of Christ Jesus the Lord, brings up the oldest question that has ever challenged human reason. And especially in times of crisis, whether personal or national or international, this question, who and where and what is God, 
And what is my relationship to him? This question, this gravid question, intrudes itself. You young people have come to the earth at a time when moral conflict and moral skepticism is raging on a colossal scale. Millions of young people of your age have been systematically and relentlessly indoctrinated by agents of the Antichrist. And someday you're going to be called upon as a great army to go out and meet them, and you'll need faith to sustain you in that conflict. Furthermore, not only do millions deny him positively, but other millions, thoughtlessly mouthing worn-out creeds, deny him as effectively when they say he's incomprehensible, immaterial, and has neither feeling nor parts. It's important, young people, that you have moral ideals and lofty ideas concerning your source and your destiny if you are to live abundantly. Faith in him as your father will help you to hold a high opinion of yourselves. And I hope you may, each of you, take as a prayer to breathe each day. Help me, O oh God, to hold a high opinion of myself. Not in any sense of egotism, but in the sense of some knowledge of your source and your purpose and your destiny. Dr. Milliken said on one occasion, the most important thing for young people to learn is that they came from somewhere and that they're going somewhere. The great architect of the universe never built a stairway that leads to nowhere. Now many of you may wonder, and sometimes you ask, what do scientists say on this subject? And there is great emphasis today on scientific education, and it's being emphasized particularly by those who deny God. But true scientists would probably say, if asked about him as scientists, that they have not discovered as scientists anywhere a supreme being. But to say that because they cannot prove him, they thereby disprove him, is a gratuitous assumption which they do not make. Many scientists are men of great faith. I shall not spend time on that other than to make that declaration. There are those who say God is just the ultimate reality, the unknowable, the totality of things. It's hard to understand how men could get much enthusiasm or comfort from calling upon the great unknowable or the totality of things, or how they could become in any sense a moral aspiration or something that we'd like to become or be like. Only a personal God is a moral ideal. You cannot imagine moral growth without a moral ideal. And only such a one can guarantee the ultimate triumph of righteousness. And it's that for which you will eventually give your lives. Perhaps at this point we should stop for a moment and ask ourselves just what do the Latter-day Saints mean by the word God? 
As an answer to that, I turn to Dr. Talmage. We claim scriptural authority for the assertion that Jesus Christ was and is God, the Creator, the God who revealed himself to Adam, Enoch, and all the antediluvian patriarchs and prophets down to Noah. Jesus Christ was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Israel as a united nation, and the God of Ephraim and Judah after the disruption of the Hebrew nation. He was the God who made himself known to the prophets from Moses to Malachi. He's the God of the Old Testament record. He was the God of the Nephites. And we affirm that Jesus the Christ is Jehovah, the Eternal One, the Creator of heaven and earth, the Redeemer and Savior of the world. And Dr. Talmage goes further, and I'd like you young folks to think with him and me along this line. For we're speaking now of in the beginning. We're speaking now of him who had a pre-existence. We're speaking of him as he stood with God the Father at the beginning of all things. The Father operated, says Dr. Talmage, in the work of creation through the Son, who thus became the executive through whom the will, commandment, or word of the Father was put into effect. It is with incisive appropriateness, therefore, that the Son, Jesus Christ, is designated by the Apostle John as the Word. The part taken by Jesus Christ in the creation, a part so prominent as to justify our calling him the creator of the world, is set forth in many scriptures, ancient and modern. The author of the epistle to the Hebrews refers in this wise distinctively to the Father and to the Son as separate though associated beings. He said, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners has spoken unto the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. Reaffirm, reaffirming the statement previously made concerning him as the creator, and therefore, in a very real sense, the father of this world, the God of our fathers. Paul in Colossians goes further and says, For by him and through him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things and by him all things consist. For more than a hundred years, the Latter-day Saints have been asserting their faith in God. Beginning with the declaration of the prophet, we believe in God the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ, and in the Holy Ghost. For many years, practically all churches took a contrary view, and many of us have been mobbed because we dared to refer to God as a personal being. Fortunately, times have changed and are changing. And to cite the change, I'd like to bring to you some words from a recent author who says there has been a marked change in the teaching of the churches concerning God. And most thinking men and scholars now believe him to be a personal being and not an abstract essence. In his book, The Century of Change in Religion, George Harris 
speaks of the change that has come about and makes note of the fact, and it is a fact, that within the last, he says, 50 years, I may say 100 years, there has been more change in the thinking and pronouncements of men with regard to religion than in all the time that preceded that time. He says the thought of God from the conception of sovereignty is changed to conception of him as the Father. The emphasis is shifted from sovereignty to fatherhood. And I'd like to leave that with you young people as you approach him. And I hope you will approach him day and night and through the day and through the night and talk with him. For he is a reality and he knows you and who you are and where you are and sent you here for a purpose. And he trusts you and asks you to trust him. Harris goes on to say, and he's speaking for a large segment of people today, God is a person. He is intelligence, and that is purpose and plan. He is will, and that is realizing purpose. He is love, and that is a person related to person. Whatever more than personality as we know it he may be, he is that in perfection, which our best is in imperfect degree. He emphasizes the fact that the discoveries and influences of the modified religious belief have come upon us within the recollection of many of us who are now living. And then this very remarkable declaration by John Haynes Holmes. I ask you to think of these young students because until now you have been considering God in terms of your primary, your Sunday school, your MIA, your home teaching, all of which have contributed to and made for a faith in God, but that faith is now going to be tested. Not that in this great church-supported institution there will be any contrary opinions expressed. But you're going to be trained to think. And to think coherently and independently. And you will be from time to time reminded that you have freedom to think. Some other time I'd like again to speak of that. But Holmes says, if God is not a person, if the divine spirit in whom we live and move and have our being is not personal as we are personal, if the fundamental reality in which is in all and through all and over all cannot be addressed by the personal pronoun, cannot be accurately described as a father and a friend, then why should we build our churches or speak our prayers or join in public service of worship? The thought of God as a personality is a necessary condition of everything that is contained within the field of religious experience. If this thought can be justified, then every idea and practice of religion can be justified against the most violent assaults of its enemies. The alternative to the thought of God as a person is the thought of him as substance or energy or chiefly as law. And he stops, asks us to stop and consider for a moment what it would mean, what would it mean to you to try and obey the will of substance or to love energy or to worship law. You'll have some idea at least of how near this question of the personality of God really comes to the heart of religion when you consider these things. Down through the ages, the prophets have testified of Jesus the Christ as the God of this world and the creator thereof and the redeemer of the sons of men. Going back to Adam, down from him through the prophets, they testified of him. Moses walked and talked with him. 
Isaiah predicted in very definite terms his birth and the conditions surrounding him at the time. And then God the Father himself on numerous occasions appeared and introduced Jesus the Christ. Think of it, young people. The Father of all appeared again and again and recognized and introduced his son as the executive head of all his operations in this world of ours. He appeared at the baptism of Jesus. He appeared on the Mount of Transfiguration. He appeared to the Nephites. And I think of no more moving or dramatic or beautiful passage in all literature than is contained in the 11th chapter of 3rd Nephi. I wish we had time to consider it together and think of its import and its meaning and of the actuality of what happened there before a multitude of people. I shall take time to just refer. There they were, these people, cowed and fearful, hiding in the shadow of the temple after three days of intense darkness and terrific commotion in the world. And they were crying unto God for deliverance, and then they heard a voice. The record says it was a small voice, and yet it pierced them to the very center of their hearts. They heard it three times and did not understand. And then they heard these memorable words again. This is my beloved son. Hear him. And after he had thus been introduced, they looked up. And brethren and sisters, they actually saw a personage in the form of a man glorified beyond description, descending from the heavens. And these are the words he used. Behold, I am Jesus Christ, whom the prophets testified shall come into the world. And behold, I am the light and life of the world. And I have drunk out of that bitter cup which the Father has given me, and have glorified the Father in taking upon me the sins of the world in which I have suffered the will of the Father in all things from the beginning. And then the record goes on to tell us that in his presence the people fell to the earth as we doubtless would do under similar circumstances. They could not comprehend the majesty and glory of the occasion and the meaning of it all. And they seemingly found it difficult to believe that this was really Jesus, the Christ, who had been crucified. And knowing of their unbelief or the difficulty they were having in trying to comprehend, he said to them, as he said to the doubting Thomas in Jerusalem, Arise and come and feel of my hands and behold that it is I. And the whole multitude passed by him and confirmed what they had seen and heard by what they felt physically and spiritually. And they declared him to be the Son of God. In our own day, Joseph the prophet appealed to God for guidance. And again, characteristically, the father came. And rather than himself to tell the boy prophet what to do, he turned to his beloved son and said, This is my beloved son. Hear him. And it was Jesus the Christ upon whom Joseph leaned the balance of his tumultuous life. And it was Jesus the Christ that delivered him time and time again. And it was to Jesus Christ that he finally went. He appeared to Joseph and Oliver again and listened to one of the finest testimonies ever given of him, given after their vision in the Kirtland Temple 
And now, after the many testimonies which have been given of him, this is the testimony, last of all, that we give of him that he lives. For we saw him, even on the right hand of God, and we heard the voice bearing record that he is the only begotten of the Father, that by him and through him and of him the worlds are and were created, and the inhabitants thereof are begotten sons and daughters unto God. Sometimes young people say that old folks are behind the times, and I have no doubt at all they're right. But I remind you of what President Clark said, that there's a lot of time behind the old men. Young men and women, out of the time that is behind me, I have distilled a faith in a personal and living God, which I consider to be my most priceless possession. It has been my glorious privilege to know him. After a lifetime of service, I have been asked to become, even I, a witness for him. I say to you, young people, and I stand very close to the brink of eternity as I say it, he has been so good to, as to give to me a personal knowledge of God the Father and that Jesus of Nazareth is his Son, the eternal God, the Savior of the world, our Redeemer and our friend. I bring you that testimony with a humble prayer that God will help you as you leave this building today to carry with you and retain not necessarily what has been said, but what you now feel. For as his servant, and in his name, I say to you that this room is filled as was the atmosphere on the day of Pentecost with the Spirit of the Holy Ghost bearing witness to you that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, the Savior and Redeemer of the world. And under the influence of that Spirit, I leave my testimony with you humbly. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.